When you hear the word Jamaica, what do you think of? White sand beaches? Hot sun? Cool drinks and jerk chicken? When I hear the word Jamaica, I think of the place that my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents called home. I think of family, friends, and my community. But I also think of violence, inequality, and poverty. Most importantly, I think of the people. And that is what this project is about, Jamaican people, and the barriers that have been put in place over hundreds of years that advantage some and disadvantage many. This film is about the presence of a color bias on an island where the majority of people are black and of African descent. This film is from Colonization to Cake Soap, Colorism in Jamaican Society. Cover the true meaning and origins of the word colorism and its presence in Jamaica, I set out on a journey to interview friends and relatives and to get to understand how they saw the term as it applied to Jamaican society. For myself, it is uh, using color as a basis of discrimination. And so it is using that vehicle to make decisions on the worth of someone. Colorism for me is the activation in someone's mind that the, the shade of one's skin matters for whatever reason in a particular instance. If it is that shade of your skin doesn't matter, then I don't think you're exercising colorism because you don't see color. So it's the whole activation once it is a determinant factor for anything. That is colorism. Once I had a working definition of the term colorism, I wondered, where had this bias originated from? What was the historic significance of this presence of light skin over dark? So I set out to talk to someone who I thought just might have the answer. Well, it all goes back to slavery. Once slavery existed, and one of the reasons why it existed was because it was easy to identify black people so that um, you didn't have to be scratching your head and trying to figure out if somebody was a slave or not, or a free man or not. I mean, you automatically assume that a black person is a slave and it's his, <laughs> it's his responsibility to persuade you that he's not, if he's not. During slavery, where a white and an African came together and had a child, that's a mulatto and that child had a special privilege and would not necessarily be enslaved so a lot of African Jamaican slave women sought out white men to be the father of their children because they didn't want to condemn their children to poverty or to the lower status and then if a mulatto person had a child for African Jamaican person that child is called a sambu so Asambo is not black, so in the stratification would be the white at the top, mulatto there, Sambo there, and at the bottom it would always be African black people in Jamaica. Without slavery we would not have had um, quote-unquote colorism uh, as we know it in the New World. This knowledge left me wondering how this bias has impacted people, both on the island and in the communities of the Jamaican diaspora. 
so I asked around to see if there was anyone who had a few stories that they would be willing to share. So in my family of 11 children, virtually half of us have come to be light and half dark skin. So my father, it's kind of awful for me to say this, practiced racism in the, in the home. He would, I recall, you know, so many instances, but there's a particular instance in which he put me on his lap and he rubbed my head and said, son, you're going to have to cut this hair very low and oil it and brush it if you want to reach anywhere in Jamaica. Because in my family, I have, I have from the light right down to the darkest of the darkest, all right? And when the, when the white skin is around, my grandparents treat them different from the way they treat us, right? They, for instance, I'll give you an example. They'll come down and they'll take out those china wares, nice china wares, and that's what go on the table, right? When they are not there, you don't see china wear, right? They just keep them in the safe, right? Uh, when they come, like for instance with me, they want me to do things for them, and they, they are like a demanding set of people because of the color, and they figure that can't even give you a reward of even thank you, right? And then, if you go to where they live in Kingston, right? It's like you're not welcome, right? They don't, they don't invite you inside. They come outside to the door and talk to you high or so, and then you're gone, right? When I left high school and decided I wanted to go to college, I was, I, you know, didn't have the money, my parents. I decided to work with the, the airline called Air Jamaica. And to do an interview to work in Air Jamaica in 1974, I had to send them a photograph of a college photograph of myself in the application. And I was not naive. I knew what that was about. So when I got the job, I got a job, a front desk job in the cargo section not in the normal passenger section. And when I checked the qualifications of the people who were in the passenger section of the airline, meeting the regular passengers, their qualification was not as good as mine. But I was put way around the back of the airport in the cargo section. But I found that it was not just brown-skinned people who had experiences with color. Speaking with many of my lighter skinned relatives, I began to understand the complexities of this issue. Being light skinned, you know, I'm not going to even pretend that I would have experienced as much um, discrimination, so to speak. Um, you know, that is not the case at all. But they, they, on the flip side, it's interesting. I, when I was, um, about 10, 11, we lived a little bit outside of Kingston in a past a village that was mainly made up of, of darker skinned people. And I recall, you know, driving through, like being driven through or walking through with my cousins um, through that village and being laughed at and kind of mocked for being light skinned, you know, being called red, red, red near gun, you know, these kinds of terms that they use. So it's funny, the, the discrimination was sort of reverse, you know, to what you would normally assume it to be. Well, I think um, the shade of your skin definitely was the most prominent situation by which you were judged. Um, class was also a big issue. Where you lived definitely was. Not necessarily where your parents are from, but I think education played a big role in the way you were treated. And unfortunately for some of the darker skinned individuals who never got a chance to go to school and learn proper English or just general topics in common, the lighter skinned um, individuals 
were given way more um, opportunities to better themselves. And that was the yardstick by which they were measured. I don't know if I had an experience. I think the first time for me maybe was in high school and in my last years of high school mainly. I, and again, that thing with, I had friends at school and I remember um, one girl that I was quite friendly with and we did a lot together, but it was only at school. Um, never went to her home or anything. Um, and yet still in later years, you know, that went away. Um, so, yeah. did not even see colorism as a major issue in Jamaica, but thought, rather, that class was what truly separated the country. Unlike the color divide, the class divide in Jamaica is spoken about regularly and acknowledged just like any other part of society. There is a, there is a certain amount of color prejudice too, I'm sure, but class prejudice is really what we are more subject to. It was more a class thing than the color of your skin. Because if you were white and you you were of a certain class that they think wasn't up to mark, the white people wouldn't as associate with you. But if you were black and you were like a doctor's daughter or a lawyer's daughter and you had good education, oh, they appreciated that. So it was more of a class thing than a colored color thing. Well, I think in a broader sense, um Class and culture are certain things that define people and define individuals. If you look at arranged marriages, generally marriages are arranged by between people of similar class or similar strata or similar backgrounds or similar interests. So class definitely plays a defining role in a lot of society. Um, culture, of course, is also huge. Um, how color impacts on that, uh, I think, depends on the society that you're in. Color has a much greater impact in different societies and in others. Well, at school or wherever there are public functions, it doesn't really matter whether you're white or you're black. They all get on very well. It's <clears throat> but it depends on your financial or economic status that really separates you. Because at the end of the day, we go to different areas and it is usually according to your economic standing. So there is definitely a class divide, but not a color divide as such. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty harmonious country. As a matter of fact, our, our motto, which you will see on our currency, says, out of many, one people. And I said, girl, tell me what's your name? And she tell me that her name is Jamaica. And I said, smile, girl, smile. Although many people did not notice or acknowledge a strong color bias taking place in Jamaica, when they traveled outside of the island, they noticed a difference in the way that they were treated and connected this treatment to a bias based on the color of their skin. In Trinidad, no. When I went there the first time, I remember going into a store to buy a a bit of fabric and I it was an embroidered material I took it up and was looking at it and a white woman came in and she didn't say excuse she just pulled it from me because she wanted to see it too and I just left it I didn't bother with her and when the clerk came around she said to me don't bother you'll have to put up with a lot of things like that here it's strange I mean I'm sure that in, in various times. Okay, so I had a job in the bank at one point. I worked in the Ministry of Agriculture. I was a teacher. I taught all different kids. I taught boys mostly at George's. And they were white, they were brown, they were black, but they were all brilliant. Because to get into St. George's, you had to have a high, you had to pass the, the exam at a high level, the, the common, well, the common, what is the common entrance at a high level, right? 
Um, and I found that they were very affectionate and they were rude and whatever. It was fine. But there wasn't, there wasn't a color thing. I feel the color thing coming to Canada. As a 17 year old coming to Canada, I remember one day going to the pharmacy and there was a long line of us at the pharmacy uh, to, to pay for something. And when I got to the cashier, the girl walked away from the cash. I thought this was so strange. <coughs> so the owner of the thing told her to get back there and, and, and look after me and she was behaved really bad. Anyway, I went home, I went to Uncle Junior and I told Uncle Junior, you know, I had a funny experience today, you know. He said, so what happened? I said, you know, this woman was treating me like a Rasta, you know, like how they treat us as Rastas. Uncle Junior started to laugh. Rasta? <laughs> Rasta, he said, Georgia, they don't know about no Rasta in Canada. It's black, you're black. I thought, oh, that's what it is. So living in Nova Scotia, that was another place where you became very cognizant of being black and being discriminated against because of black. As she just alluded to, there was a particular way in which Rastafarians were and still are regarded in Jamaica. Historically, they were seen as part of a lower class and were therefore treated very badly in comparison with middle and upper class Jamaicans. This had to do with a perception on the part of non-Rastafarians that the Rastas were not clean cut enough for their schools, their businesses, and their communities. I was the person, who, as an attorney, who got a lost child to go into a public school. A lost child in Jamaica could not go into a public school in the 70s. It is not until the 80s where I did that case in Camperdown, argued by my friend, who is a Rastafarian attorney, that Rastafarian children were allowed into schools. I found that there truly was a wide range of perspectives on colorism, even between people who grew up within a few miles of each other. Noting this range of opinions and experience, I decided to shift the conversation slightly and ask about a much more prominent issue affecting Jamaica's youth today, the practice of skin bleaching. Boy, two bush up and tell the girl them up browning. All of the girl them a run go and shop for bleach. Cause them want brown skin. All of the girl them. And them a bleach. Them a bleach out them skin. Them a bleach. Feel look like a browning. Them a bleach. Them a bleach out them skin. Them a bleach. Feel look like a browning. Girl, me Anna you. And you no bleach out your skin. You no use no chemical. Feel look like no browning. Girl, me Anna you. And you no bleach out your skin. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. I mean, I have somebody even, um, the environment that I work, I have people who work in the haulage industry and you have people that assist on the trucks, quote unquote, delivery guys. And there's one individual who, he bleached his entire face and I asked him, why is he doing it? He says, oh, mommy doing it and my sister them doing it, somebody doesn't want to look like them too. And I'm saying, but for what? And it took me a while to convince him that this is not the right way to do it. You can't destroy God's beautiful skin that he has given you to try to prove a point to your, your, your siblings, your parents, and also society. It doesn't work. But I guess you can't tell them because this is how they feel that they can be accepted. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a bad situation. What is happening here now, worse in Jamaica? I mean, if you Google bleaching, Jamaica is the first thing you see. What surprises me is not that people feel pressured to bleach their skin if their relatives are doing it, but that a large segment of the Jamaican population chooses to bleach their skin under the advice and support of dance hall artists, one of whom, Vibes Cartel, is said to be the Don. Before I go into the lecture, I'd like to ask anyone from the audience to answer this question. Who, who is Vibes Cartel? Vibes Cartel is the most influential and popular DJ in Jamaica. He sings a lot of rotten stuff, a lot of gory sexual things in his lyrics. However, he has lightened his skin and has built up a following of bleachers, which is very interesting for me. Um, so that 
yes, it's on the uprise and you know, like bleaching your skin is, I would say in the ghetto, as I said before, more than 50% of young people, male and female, are lightening their skin and think they're very pretty when they lighten their skin. And that demonstrates to you the depth of the problem. I think it was sometime in early 2000s I, I realized, I like you knew people bleach, but it was a shame attached to it, but now it's like shameless. It's like, oh, um, I have to wear this right now because I'm bleaching. Or you see them in the lane, they're bleaching. Or, you know, so it's just become this whole acceptance. And of course, you know, our, 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 our mentors, um, like dancehall artists, are the ones who are promoting it and pushing it. So it further validates it. And, and I, they genuinely believe that if they're lighter skin, that, that people would, would, uh, would find them more attractive, the people who they're trying to attract. I guess the people who matter in their lives. I guess not employers, but you know, um, lovers or the people around them. I guess if they, when they bleach, that they, they, they feel like it makes them more attractive. So they they really invest in it. People people don't know it. An artist will have to say one stupid thing, and they all follow behind what they say. I think they're more going towards what they say than they own even their own Bible itself. If I can use a term or or, or reasonability, you know. Uh, artist says, you know, fire burn something or, or, or bleach your skin or you have, if, you look, if you want to look good, you have to do this. So they have a high influence on the society right now. I, I did a commercial the other day with this 18 year old and we had to go there to do the voiceover and I was like, why you have on this pants? She said, oh, she bleach or blow her off part. I think, I think she, <laughs> it was some plastic, I don't know the regime some plastic business but it's just a thing that they do and it's um it is ironically i don't know if it happens in the high income brackets but it's, it, it happens in the low income um bracket of society i don't know if if it is it's some psychology that you know probably them they're already seen in a certain way in society them probably don't have the the money to get where they really want to be so if this is one thing i can control so i feel confident about me you know if me making myself look lighter is something i can control and have a better self presence about myself in life then that's one thing i can control i think i think that's it so it all has to do with um income brackets and, and, and classism. This project really opened up my eyes to the complexities of Jamaican culture and the factors which strongly influence it. I believe that colorism is still one of the most stratifying factors of Jamaican society, but I would be remiss to end without noting the undoubted influence it had on class and the influence that class has on Jamaica. I actually called Kanye West classism, which is a cousin of racism, um, which is the, the biggest thing for me, for, 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 for me here in Jamaica. It's, it's so much more classism, really, because, yeah, that, 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 that's a major thing, too. Regardless of their positions on class and color biases in Jamaica, one thing is for certain. Whether living at home or abroad, Jamaican people love their country. Well, basically, I can share with you and say, have you been to Jamaica? Basically, I would say Jamaica to me is the best. Yeah, <laughs> Jamaica to me is the best. Like when you're there, you just feel different. From you know, in the plane and it passed over Cuba and uh, start, everybody start to sink, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's it, you know. So Jamaica is good apart from the, 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 the system that we had before with the whites and the black. And the, the whites and the black is caused from the British system. You know, British people, they are the ones that cause the whole situation. They are the one that cast the slavery business down there too, so you know what I mean? So that's it. But but apart from that, Jamaica is okay. Just now we're having too much 
ki lenne a névek az adóz, csak pedig ilyen leállom, de nem volt. Én a papám megígott, hogy még kell, I love it, de nem volt. So I still encourage you to go. Right? Yeah. Yeah.